and these are in listen only mode. I want to welcome everybody to today's web chat, How Big Data is Changing New Product Development. This is Julie Annixter. I'm the executive editor and co-founder of Innovation Excellence, and it is a delight to be with you all. Um, joining us today, I've got two people I know you're really going to enjoy. Kobe Gershoni, who is the chief research officer and co-founder of Signals, and an advisor, a trusted advisor to um, lots of Fortune 500 companies who are taking the plunge and using big data to drive their product development efforts. And Tom Davenport, who is a quite an accomplished person. I'm going to just read a quick laundry list. If you don't know him, Tom has been um, is the author of uh, four books on big data. A professor at Babson College, a research a researcher at MIT. He's really one of the people that first brought knowledge management as a discipline to um, into the public eye, and has has evolved along with it to become really a leading expert on big data. He's also an advisor to the Signals Group. So welcome, Tom and Kobe. Thank you. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, great, to have, great to have you guys here. We've got a global audience today. We've got people in Israel and Florida and um, all over the United States and Europe. So again, we're delighted. And I just want to reinforce that for all of the folks in our audience, we welcome your questions throughout. Um, you have a little hand on your um, grab tab, it's under your orange arrow, and if you'd like, you can just practice raising it if you want to try that right now, it's sort of a fun little game, see if you can find it. Um, you only really need to use it if you'd like to speak live to Tom and Kobe towards the end when we actually take your questions live, but feel free to share them with us um, throughout. So I'm really excited about today's webinar and the content that we're going to be covering. Um, and let me just run through it quickly. Um, Tom's going to talk about in, in information revolutions and what really is the new normal. And he's done a tremendous amount of research on the era of analytics, the eras of analytics that we are living through. And both Tom and Kobe will talk about how the new data, new big data, is really changing the business environment. They'll give examples of how real companies are using big data, making decision making in real time part of their practices and how that's driving a need for revitalized practices. We'll look at how this is actually different than before, including like three months ago, because the landscape is really moving uh, quickly and changing rapidly. And we'll, we really want to spend time on how new product development leaders are preparing for a multi-data environment. And if you don't know what multi-data environment is, don't worry, I didn't either until fairly recently. So we're all going to get smarter together. And then we'll, we'll really end by foot stomping how is this going to be applied to the new product development process. So I'm really excited to be here. And I just want to ask Tom and Kobe, maybe starting with you, Kobe, you're sitting next to me. Why are you excited about today? Or how are you excited about today? So I'm really excited uh, that we have to be here first. And thank you, Julie, for setting this up and for the Innovation Excellence uh, Group. Um, I'm really excited because I think we have reached um, an era where the knowledge and technology uh, really allow us uh, to make the kind of the next jump into actionable use of big data. And I think that you know throughout this discussion today, we're really uh, looking forward to revealing uh, with Tom the, the magic of big data analytics. Fantastic. And, and how about you, Tom? Well, let me first say that I'm hurt that I was not invited to be there in person, but I guess I'm excited uh, about the content anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, no, I um, I'm excited. One to sort of you know I, I'm always excited talking about um, big data and analytics and all those topics. But also, um, what's particularly exciting for me is applying it to an area where it doesn't normally get applied. The the whole area of new product development and in particular the earliest stages of new product development. Um, if you've looked at that topic, you know it's um, somewhat problematic in terms of, uh, you know, being very intuition-based, very loosey-goosey, uh, people call it the fuzzy front end, the last bastion of kind of unaided um, intuition, and, and it doesn't work terribly well. You know, they, they about 95% of new products fail. So um, 
I think it's high time that we took a somewhat more disciplined, structured approach to using information to make better decisions in that space, and that's really what we're going to talk about. Fantastic. So in your books, Tom, you've written a lot about information revolutions. Um, help, us, help us understand today what you mean by the new normal for information. You know, what, what is Analytics 3.0, and where did it come from? Uh, well, it's you know probably not widely known, but last year, 2014, was kind of the, um, the 60th anniversary of um, large organizations using analytics to make decisions. Um, the first one at UPS in 1954, and you know that was a very back office phenomenon. It was um, you know up until quite recently, at least the turn of the century, um, it was. Um, highly structured processes like supply chain. Um, the, there was a big distance between the people who did the analytics work and the um, decision-making work. Um, that all changed with you know companies like Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and so on in, in the earliest part of the big data era where really those companies um, made big data and analytics their business. It was at the core of what they did. It was um, not just to make internal decisions, but to create new products um, and services, and um, obviously that worked pretty well for them. 3.0 is really where we are now, where every company can start to um, do those same kinds of things, where we combine big and small data and so on. And I think it's really uh, an era of, of integration um, of of different types of data and, and various other phenomena in um, uh, drastically expanded scale and scope. Well, thank you. And, and speaking of that scale and scope, this is a chart that comes from your book, your most recent book, which I have been reading and really enjoying, Big Data at Work, where you contrast the all data economy with two earlier waves. Can you kind of walk us through this so help our audience go deeper and understand the far right column in terms of how analytics 3.0 is you know, different at a more granular level and the implications for product developers? Sure. I mean, it's, um, it's a, as you can see, if you ha um, look at these different categories, it's a much more inclusive era in the, in the sense of um, this applies to all types of companies. Um, it's um, in, to improve internal decisions and to create new um, analytics and data-oriented products and services, um, all types of data combined, a broad portfolio of technologies, you know, um, data warehouses, sure, Hadoop, sure, you know, you see all of these things get combined into um, uh, uh, an architecture for Analytics 3.0. Um, all functions and units participate, including new product development, and I think if new product development doesn't participate in the whole move toward more analytical decisions and more systematic use of information in decision making, it's really going to be left behind in the, you know, the whole uh, movement to a new way of thinking about, about business. Yeah, it really, really makes sense. Kobe, do you want to weigh in and you know, what are you seeing the implications are really for product developers? Yeah, so um, I agree with Tom. I think a lot of change and I think we're reaching the um, almost a third era in which uh, we are ushering new types of analytics, uh, new frameworks, and practitioners are becoming more uh, relevant to do jobs in the organization. And this corresponds with innovation and new product developers adopting the various new tools for uh, you know, better and faster product development. I think some of them you know, include the, um, different innovation practices and methodologies. Uh, we see it in uh, implementing on it uh, on stage gate systems. Uh, we see new uh, um, various types of uh, data platforms and advanced analytics connected to it. And and e even more interesting is the uh, use of the crowd and you know e-commerce or social networks. And I, and it seems like um, you know we are in a never-ending digital revolution, and the competitive environment is becoming uh, you know much more. Uh, in, in, in affecting the way that the decisions are being made. So we need to become smart, faster and smarter about uh, the way that we act. Um, and, you know, coming from uh, signals, it's, it's really 
how you uh, interrogate the data and become more sophisticated about it. And, uh, I think that's basically how you can uh, grow your business and become more sustainable once the uh, product reaches the market. Can I just say one more thing, um, Julie? I think Kobe <laughs> raises a good good point here, which is that you know in new product development, we now do have fairly systematic um, transactional tools, uh, usually called product lifecycle management. Mm -hmm. um, and in almost all areas of business, you see this transition from, okay, getting the transactional systems in place to starting to analyze the data much uh, more aggressively. And you see it in human resources, you see it in sales, you see it in all these relatively you know, unstructured uh, business functions traditionally. And I think you're going to see the same thing in new product development where we we shift from, okay, I put in a PLM system, how do I start to make better decisions about about all this stuff? Cool. Well, you know, in your last HBR article last year, you said that the big data model was a huge step forward, but it wasn't going to provide an advantage for much longer. And that companies that want to prosper in the new data economy must once again, gosh, we get tired of this, we have to do this all the time, once, must once again fundamentally rethink how the analysis of data can create value. So can you go a little deeper here, Tom, and talk to us about what you mean about fundamentally rethinking how big data can create value? Sure, Julie. I mean, the, um, the average company, uh, <laughs> the, the good news is they don't have to go to, um, anal through the analytic 2.0 stage, because that was mostly just for online businesses in, in the online industry in Silicon Valley or wherever. Um, they can skip right from analytics 1.0 to 3.0, which is to kind of combine big data and small data, um, you know, spread it all across their organizations, and particularly look for those areas where you just have a poor track record of decision making. Um, I mean, I, I think of it, new product development is kind of like um, movie making. Uh, the, um, the average uh, Hollywood movie uh, has about a 6% chance of making money. The, the average new product uh, has about a 5% chance of making money. Um, so whenever you have that kind of really low success rate, you know it's an opportunity to apply more rigorous thinking. And, you know, I, it's going to be a race, I think, where do we see this first, in movie making or in um, new product development because you are starting to see even Hollywood movies starting to be made on the basis of much more analytics about you know what, how likely is this topic and these stars and so on uh, how likely are they going to to succeed so it's just it's time that we got much more systematic about it. Thank you. What's your take on this, Kobe? Um, so you know I want to kind of touch on it from a different I mean, angle on the the opportunity around creation of new data sources. Let's, let's get a little bit deeper into the big data. Um, and we're in a, in a kind of a time of scale. And it does allow us to do a lot of things, but I think we're developing new techniques to derive a new type of insight. Um, we can identify new market opportunities beyond the traditional, you know, product that and the business models that exist, um, understand better the consumers and the technologies and the maturity that they're reaching. So moving all of these data sources into analytics is basically making us as decision makers and prediction, predict, sorry, uh, predictors, predictors <laughs> um, smarter. Um, and we just not not just, you know, rely on old techniques. It's a really new era of analytics because the data is available and it's structured, much more it's structured because of the tools and capabilities that are out there. <clears throat> well, speaking of structured, um, so in this new information age, Tom, with the vast amount of structured and unstructured data, what's the um, impact on business practice that you're seeing? as you go around the world and consult with companies? Well, yeah, this, this um, slide is a pretty good illustration of the kind of um, big and small data that you're likely to combine in the analytics 3.0 environment. Um, so um, 
you see some highly structured kinds of information around, you know, product databases and so on, uh, financial transactions, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, in new product development, you have all this external data. You know, I think that's one of the mo most interesting attributes of big data. It's much more likely to be external. It's much more likely to be unstructured. And so the ability to combine that to understand what a customers really want, what are people saying about our other products, what's happening in the world of research related to, to what we're doing, I think that's where the real power lies for this particular process of, of new product development. And speaking of new product developments, here's the new product development funnel with the business webinar without a funnel. This chart shows the archetypal new product development process. So next question, um, Tom, how is Analytics 3.0 changing the business environment around this kind of funnel? Well, I'll let um, Kobe more the new product development expert than I am, but I think um, uh, the vast majority of organizations that I work with don't have, I mean, they, they have a funnel in terms of, of how products go through this process, but they don't have a funnel in terms of what information they use at each stage, what decisions they need to make at each stage. And so um, I think the, the powerful thing about some of these ideas that Signals is bringing forth is, you know, you can specify some of these information and decisions to be made and so on in this process just like any other. And this is a good representation of, of that idea. Yeah, Tom, I think, you know, I want to add to that, um, that you know, with the creation of multi types of data and information sources, is really changing the research process, as you said, and how we derive our information input. For example, if you think about it, decision makers have adopted social media listening tools to try to capture consumer sentiment. We have to create about what other information sources tell us and how to structure and model these different data sources in a way that derives business value. Um, and I think it's really the connection between the sources, as you said. So we saw earlier the two, the three circles, but only when you connect them together, the nuggets start to become alive. So, you know, you can make and verify um, in a way, in a very confident uh, predictions about where a company is going uh, to move their product categories uh, based on the public and open source uh, as we said, by looking at the, um, the patents, um, the, the way that they are writing their publications, what their scientists are writing about in the journal, and the partnerships that they do with different academia institutes, I think all of them um, really gives us a good understanding about how we can kind of foresee where the companies or the competitors and the ecosystem is taking place, and I think you know it's a question to many of our listeners: How many are they, you know, practicing it today? No, I agree, and not. I think the answer would be not not terribly many. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a great opportunity here. Well, we really do seem like we're at the beginning of a new era of um, applying big data to start development, and you know, you said not to quote you, but the point is not to be dazzled but rather to analyze it, to convert it into insights, innovation, and business value. So, um, Kobe, instead of being dazzled by the sheer volume, how do you guys approach this challenge? You guys um, call this intelligence. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? And I'm going to forward to the next slide so we can show people what we're, what we're really talking about. Yeah, this is the cycle of intelligence. And I think uh, you touched on, on the point um, that given the vast in a multi-data environment, we have found it's even more crucial that the business decision uh, will drive the analytics and the data approach. Otherwise, you will fail to extract immediate value and invest a lot of resources and money without no clear return. So, you know, in the military intelligence, uh, we work according to the system of an operation. We are driven first by objectives uh, and decisions that is to be made or actions to be taken. Uh, the objective is what determines the approach and the resources, the type of information collected, and the time frame that um, 
is considered um, in the uh, execution of an operation. We have to approach the business decision making in the same way. The decision that is to be made is what they dictates the questions that are asked, as you can see in the in the cycle here. Um, and then the data collected, of course, and the analysis conducted. This is what we, we consider to be the best practice uh, intelligence. Uh, one of the problems that with big data is that people usually start with the data and starting to kind of understand what, you know, does it tell them. Um, and they're not necessarily connected to hypotheses or decisions and actions that they uh, want to apply. Now, I don't think that, you know, we don't want to confuse anyone in this discussion, but working with hypotheses in a way of top-down and asking questions doesn't mean that you're not making new discoveries from the data pattern, pattern. Um, which means that, you know, you can create a second and third level of questions as you're discovering and finding, but it is led by a direction um, and insights tell you um, new findings and new hypotheses are being created. So it's really uh, a process in which you can create the insight stronger and uh, I think it's, you know, life. Um, and I think that's what we are looking for when we're talking about 3.0 analytics, an ongoing analysis that makes you better each time you connect new data layers. Um, I think, you know, just think about the opportunities down there. I think Kobe makes a good point that, you know, we're not talking about this is not an algorithm, it's not a, a set of automated rules or anything. There's still some uh, very important role for human judgment here. It's just judgment informed by data and analysis, not, you know, pure, raw intuition and, and experience. And, and I think the decisions are, are inevitably going to be better under those circumstances. It, it does strike me that big data has become the, you know, the new bright, shiny object. And what I hear both of you saying is, okay, that's great, but start with the business problem, mm -hmm. start with the business objective, and, you know, apply the, the, the right questions to the big data versus the other way around. Absolutely. So, so speaking of that, I mean, this is, um, you know, in, in our the current world we're living in, it seems like we have to be so agile as leaders um, to adapt to um, the, 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 the voracious amount of change. Tom, can you give us an example of um, what this means for companies and, and, you know, examples of maybe, you know, where it's, where, where it's working well? Because I know you, both you and Kobe do see into that. Um, sure. I mean, I talk to a lot of organizations about their use of, of big data and analytics and their approaches to better decision making and so on. Certainly one of the most impressive um, that I've seen over the last few years is Procter & Gamble, which, you know, interestingly enough, is in an industry that's a little bit disadvantaged. They don't actually have direct exposure to their customers. Most of their products sell to retailers. Um, but they're very focused on how can we make better decisions about everything we do, how we market and do promotions, how we um, uh, feed products into our supply chains, and how we develop new products. And so, um, you know, they have these uh, fantastic rooms they call business spheres to get executives together um, to make um, decisions all around the world using the same data. Um, they have, if you um, can't make it into a business sphere, then they have these decision cockpits where you can sit at your desk or, or on your laptop and get the latest information. They're constantly pressing their information suppliers, syndicators to get them newer, better data. They're focused on um, a culture of not just what happened, uh, but why did it happen and how do we address it? And um, to facilitate that process, they um, attach embedded analysts, uh, over 200 of them, to different parts of the business. And, you know, like most organizations early on, they focused on, you know, the more traditional areas of marketing and supply chain and sales and so on, but uh, they have 
um, more recently um, started to apply this same thinking to new product development. They work with signals and they are already seeing some of the benefits in terms of products that are much more likely to be successful in the, in the marketplace. Well, thank you. And, and speaking of embedding um, analysts, um, I know that, Kobe, you have deep familiarity with the way the military uses big data. Can you give us an example from that world? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we when we started Signal, we um, we kind of we were struggling to capture the potential of uh, what we call big data. Um, our company basically struggled, and, and uh, we see the day, uh, so to speak, as you know, as military intelligence officers, um, we saw that there is a kind of a way to subvert this challenge um, and bring a higher quality level of decision. Um, to business leaders, we were inspired knowing that 80% of the intelligence work is done based off, you know, open source and uh, information. You know, when you look at this slide and, and we mentioned uncertainty, um, it's a given for a, for a operation. Uh, each and every operation is done under these conditions, even when you know planned uh, tightly. Uh, Intelligent management system were created to reduce that risk. They allow us to become more connected and know how to take the different sources to make the linkage between past events and current situations. And for the forces in the field, knowing which route to take sometimes involves tens uh, of perimeters in real time to be connected to make right decisions on how and where to, to mobilize troops. Uh, to be really, really on top of things, you need to screen through huge amounts of data, data points and, and capable of connecting those dots to identify the threats and prevent, you know, taking the wrong uh, route in a way. So, and by the way, if, if, you, if you do think about it, um, healthcare systems are trying to do exactly that in prevention of some of the uh, health conditions. They, they want to monitor the entire body system and um, the environment in, in almost real time uh, for early detection and prevention of different conditions, you know, from heart conditions to uh, early detection of uh, chronic disease, uh, all the way to manage your, your lifestyle. Um, now, think about the analogies between big data for healthcare and product development and security, and you find a lot of commonalities that can uh, help you with you know, driving decisions. So <clears throat> this is going to affect all of us, especially if we're talking about um, really using a lot of open source data as opposed to the company's data. So which practices are going to be revitalized? Which, what, what do managers and people on this call have to be thinking about doing differently? Tom, what do you think? Um, well, as Kobe suggested, I think, you know, one big um, practice that needs to be revitalized is um, understanding what are the decisions to be made. Um, you, you might be surprised at how um, often um, organizations aren't clear about that at all. If you ask them, you know, what are the top ten decisions that you need to make um, across the company or even in a particular function, they can hardly ever answer the question. Um, they don't know who's responsible for making the decision. They don't. They haven't identified, you know, how often the decision is going to be made. And so, um, I think we just need much more of a decision orientation to start with in organizations. Um, after you make the decisions, uh, Kobe mentioned the, the similarity between the military and healthcare. Um, a lot of military organizations, I don't know whether the Israeli military does this, I know the U.S. Um, Army was doing it for a while, they have these after-action reviews to kind of say, you know, what worked and what didn't. Um, Tom Brady, if I can squeeze in a plug for my uh, favorite um, Super Bowl competitor, <laughs> um, is known for very careful review of his own errors. Um, in healthcare, you know, people talk about how primitive healthcare is in terms of data and analytics, but I often uh, 
like to say, well, at least if they kill you, there will be a meeting about it. <laughs> uh, the the so-called morbidity and mortality meetings. And so um, reviewing your decisions and understanding what worked well and what didn't is a very critical um, part of the, of the process that needs to be changed. And of course, you know, just feeding more information into the, into the, into the decision, which is a big part of what we're talking about today. Toby? Yeah, so I think, you know, when, when we talk about the revitalized practices, um, the, there is a capability that needs to be in place to make those kind of activities um, and analytics um, in the organization and the enterprise. And I think, Tom, you, you know that from the whole uh, space of knowledge management. But when I look at the decisions around new product development and the opportunities, um, I look at how we can integrate decisions and data modeling. And I think where the decision is what drives the underlying analytics and the data approach. Um, so well, I just you think that you know we want to show an example on how uh, we look at a unified data model that enable us to um, to do exactly that. Okay, and just, just so I'm clear, clear here, when we're talking about a unified data, data model, we're talking about all three of these landscapes, the market landscape, the tech, technology yeah. landscape, and the customer landscape. So yeah, let's, do, let's take us through an example, please. What, what do you mean by this unified data and decision model? So it's, it's kind of a magic formula. Um, and it's about connecting the dots. So in this kind of slide, we illustrated how decisions um, help to evaluate uh, kind of the engine of entry to a market uh, with new prod with new different uh, products and procedures that are developed that enables you to connect the dots. Um, so if you look at the demand side, what we want to understand by what people are kind of discussing in the, uh, in the ecosystem, in the social domain, uh, whether it's looking at the Facebooks or the Twitters and blogs, um, you can tap into really interesting data points, and when connected to the supply side, you can look at, one second, uh, around different product databases and what they basically uh, provide. But when you make the connection between the demand and supply, you're starting to evaluate, kind of identify the, the unmet needs. I think that's where things are really becoming interesting. And when you connect that to a technology landscape, you're starting to see how innovation and startups are really populating the gap that is in the market. So in a way, when, again, connecting it back to competition and regulation and different type of government initiatives, it's where things are becoming really, really interesting. So um, what you're saying is that um, product developers, just to be really simple about it, ought to be able to um, view this entire set of data integrated based on the decisions that they have to make and actually use it to develop new products. Yeah, I think the information is out there, but the connections are not being made in ways that when connected to the process of the stage gate system for, for you know, the funnel of, of innovation, um, you can really validate hypotheses and either or dismiss them as you're kind of moving along in your research on the product and uh, product planning, uh, but it's really about making those connections that can enable you to, to do that. And I think we have an example um, that we want to share. Okay, great. So we help one of our, our clients, uh, we partner with them, uh, to identify a new opportunity for a stroke rehabilitation robotic device. Uh, we call it the signal opportunity assessment. Uh, which is designed to identify. Yeah. Uh, it looks like you've aged a little bit. So no, just. <laughs> um, I, often I'm I'm speechless, but you you, you just did that. So. <laughs> we can tell we can tell stories about you, Tom. But we won't. <laughs> this is a very nice guy that I know from back in the age. <laughs> Um, but no, seriously, we, we were helping those people um, or our company to really identify 
the new product opportunity for uh, for um, stroking rehabilitation needs. And we laid out kind of a go-to-market uh, opportunity. So we first, you know, listened to what people uh, with these issues were talking about. Um, you know, and it, it's interesting because it's not just stroke victims who had condition, but also their family members, uh, caregivers, doctors. Um, we wanted to understand what they were saying about their lives and needs. Uh, you know, what about physical uh, issues, behavioral, even psychological uh, issues with costs and prevalences. Uh, and we took those thousands of discussions and structured all of the data points to signal for analysis. Now, once we met these kind of different need statements and got better understanding of the unmet needs um, of those different profile groups, we were able to connect these data with the current solutions and brands in the market, in a way tapping into those product databases. And so we kind of see here how we connected both the consumer side, the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of different products. And basically we want to understand um, how we're answering those needs um, to those very specific profiles and who is doing what in the market. When we pull all of this data together, uh, and we evaluated uh, the development and where competition is kind of populating that gap, we started to see that there are very interesting companies and technologies and how science is answering those kind of um, needs. When we looked at the competition, we wanted to understand if, you know, are we alone or, you know, what can you tell us about the maturity of development? And is anybody doing something that we can learn from? And really just understand how big is the gap, kind of the risk versus opportunity. So if you can think about it, by connecting different layers of information, we can basically in a matter of you know, four weeks can really assess fast an opportunity um, that would not necessarily be understood by a product team without, you know, the ability to connect the dots and the different sources that are out there. Uh, so I think that's exactly the kind of the example that I like to, um, to take when we're thinking about the new age or new era of big data and connectivity to analytics. Well, and I'm sure it's provoking a lot of questions for me, and I'm sure it's provoking questions for our audience. So we're about, we're about to start taking your questions, so please feel free to share them if you've got them. Um, let's go back to people are really trying to innovate and bring mm -hmm. new products and services to market. Um, how is um, big um, public open source data most immediately impacting their work? So uh, Tom, you want to respond, or Kobe, either one of you? Well, sure, I'll just start. I mean, um, I think Kobe's example is a really interesting one because in medical devices and pharmaceuticals, um, you know, hugely, hugely expensive product development processes. And so to, you know, to venture down the, the development funnel with a product that really isn't a great idea or, you know, there, uh, there are countless examples of pharmaceutical firms that have um, gotten fairly far along in the new product development process only to, to realize that one of their competitors has, beat them to the market with exactly the same kind of drug, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars wasted in that case. So it's incredibly important to um, make these decisions much better at the early stages. And as the mm -hmm. funnel says, you know, select ideas that, that consumers really, really want and that are going to work and are market ready and that somebody else isn't likely to, to beat you to the punch on. You know, Tom, and I think that we know that most innovators, um, those that are working on kind of, you know, the cutting edge of, of trying to put ideas and products into the market, they, they recognize that they work in a very dynamic information environment. And I think that, you know, they found that innovation and new product development is, is a very compelling place where, where, you know, we can help with big data analytics. Um, to 
be faster, smarter, and cost effective in the way that they are trimming their portfolios and you know choosing or kind of betting on the right uh, product to be to be developed. Um, and I think we saw in some of the big companies that we work with um, that you know they are driven by a lot of the consumer requirements, understanding those technologies and and becoming even you know faster into understanding what kind of requirements they they need to uh, to bring into the new product. Um, so I totally agree with you that it's a very risky and expensive business to do a product. You better plan ahead and invest more time in in knowing where you kind of to take the direction. Well that's a good segue to one of our final slides here before we take your questions, which is um, you know, you, you said, Kobe, that um, you just said it, that decision makers today are operating, you know, in constant uncertainty and that it takes courage to make these kinds of decisions that are mission critical for the future and that evidence creates courage. Mm -hmm. So how does evidence create courage? From real, real experience, I'd love to hear from you. Well, I'll, I'll, I think we want to talk about the innovator. So I think that in, in innovation and in general doing new things, uh, kind of being on the line, um, there is always a balance between an art and science in a way. Uh, you're constantly on a mission trying to solve a problem. Uh, and what we're not saying that you know creating a new product is all about uh, science and technology and development. What we are saying is that data can help us in you know kind of use the power of data and and, and, and be more insightful and in the way that you're uh, doing things, developing. I think it's not just for, I think it's very typical for innovators, but in general people are, you know, on the risk. Um, when you give them those evidence and you enable them to be more creative and more free-minded to operate under these uncertainty conditions, I think that's one of the biggest powers of intelligence when smart people, you know, and these guys in the corporate and the product development um, team, they are, they are smart people, but they're so busy in getting the information and processing it and analyzing, and by the time they want to innovate, they're getting tired in so many ways. So, you know, it's really about enabling them. So I want to move quickly because we've got a lot of really great questions. So if Tom and Kobe, um, uh, if you would allow me, um, on this slide to uh, let you guys kind of sum up what you think the most important things are quickly and then let's move to questions because we've yeah. got, got a lot of them. So Tom, from your perspective, um, what do leaders have to do to prepare? Well, you know, as, as we've sort of mentioned, um, identifying what are the decisions to be made, um, getting much more systematic about um, how we're going to make those decisions, whose responsibility is it, what information will we use, how long do we, do we have. You know, if you've got to make a decision in, in a day or so, that means a very different decision-making process than one that you can uh, take um, you know, a week or a month on. Um, then you're thinking about what information can we bring to the table of all of this stuff, particularly the external information that Kobe has been addressing, I think is, is um, information that often hasn't been used in these kinds of processes. Um, how do we analyze it? How do we embed um, those analyses into our process? Do we have the people who can help us do that kind of work? If not, you know, let's look externally for them. And then um, how do we just make this entire process, particularly the one of new product development, much more analytical? I think um, those are really the, the kind of objectives that, that leaders in this space should have. Okay, cool. Kobe. Yeah, I, I think Tom kind of summarized it very well. So I think there was one, from my experience, maybe kind of out of uh, working with some of, of those groups, is that we really want um, and think that we need to get engagement between the innovation folks and, and the business people, uh, making the right connection between them and, you know, get the will to innovate and but, but most importantly, to execute. Um, I think to do that, you need to, you know, engage, try, create the right um, 
kind of organization within the organization, um, and, and, and then really apply those big data analytics uh, capabilities to, you know, to think about how you can influence decisions. So. Cool. Well, first of all, thank you, Tom and Kobe. Great discussion, and we've got so many great questions. I'm going to start with the first one from um, Chris McKinney. I'm curious about the techniques used with big data to uncover insights renovation. So I know insights are really key to innovation. What would you guys say about that? What are the techniques used to uncover insights? Well, there, I think we, we touched upon them on some of the uh, kind of opportunity assessment, um, you know, and the fast track. Um, but really identifying the unmet needs, um, um, seeing how um, the gap is uh, being opened up between what's currently in the market connected to the maturity of technologies, and then find out where are the kind of next opportunities for the product. And I think the other, I think the most important piece here is that it enables you to validate or dismiss some of those hypotheses, but mostly to move forward in a conscious way about the kind of the ideas that are uh, generated. So get, get those inputs uh, connected and and, and to your to do decision process. Great, and I and thank I, you. I would, yeah, I would just Please. say, um, just in terms of the methods for insight, you know, it's it's fair to say that we're still in the in the in the early stages here. Um, you know, we're not talking about a whole lot of algorithms or regression equations or uh, rule engines or anything like that. It's more, you know, just knowing, for example, how many people in the world are working on this particular cancer-causing protein and, um, you know, using that to, to um, make your own observations about how likely you're going to be first to the market. Is it, isn't that fair to say, Kobe? Yeah, I think it's the, the mega trends, um, the uh, gap analysis, these are the type of things that are on the level of the analytics that are connected to um, against the decision or the processes. Um, yeah. So here's another question that kind of leaps forward. And by the way, many of you have asked if the slides and the recording are going to be available. The answer is yes. You will all receive a, an email on Tuesday with a link to um, all of these assets. So no worries on that. So from our friend um, Pete Foley in Cincinnati, um, Pete asks, one challenge for innovation is being able to test it in a real world context. Innovations that test well in the lab don't always work in the real world. And what uh, while what people honestly articulate, articulate, they will do with it when they're in uh, a focus group. Often changes, you know, when they're at home and they find themselves, you know, constrained with time and the complex real world. Can you comment on ways big data might help us to more effectively measure customer response to innovation under real world conditions and in real time? Tom, you got the response to that. Yeah, you know, there was an interesting article today in the Wall Street Journal about this topic. And, you know, there's this um, uh, scientist named Paul Ekman who has classified um, facial expressions. And, you know, one of the things we've always found in, in focus groups is that um, customers don't necessarily tell you what they really think. They tell you what they think you want to hear, et cetera. Um, but, um, Ekman's work has now been uh, sort of automated to some degree. There's software that will sort of look at your face and say, uh, is this person really happy about what they're seeing or are they conflicted? So that would be an example. You know, the article suggests, and I think it's true, that you, you um, obviously run into some interesting um, privacy issues when you start analyzing people's facial expressions. But um, assuming you have permission to, to do that, I think you start to get a lot of insights about what people really think um, rather than um, what, what they're saying. And, you know, other people, Jerry Zaltman, a friend of mine uh, for many years was a professor at Harvard Business School, has done some work to try to, you know, put little meters in people's hands, little dials, because your hands give away what you feel sometimes more than your words. So, um, uh, I think we do need a lot of ways to, to get at that issue, and, and focus groups generally have not been nearly as successful as we might have hoped. 
Yeah, I, I agree on focus groups. We have been experiencing um, some great work from um, one of our clients in the um, in a chronic disease space where they were trying to look for people and make, uh, it was a rare disease actually, you don't get to those people um, and find them. So you need to listen to what their family people can remember and what they say and the, uh, what they're distressed about. Um, and when you hear them speak in social, in the social domains and connected to what KOL says or the physician talk about, you're starting to see a different type of discussion. You don't really, it's not a survey. It's just collecting the knowledge that the crowd provides you that it not necessarily replaces surveys, but it complements them in two points in time, when you, before and after. Uh, because when you match those insights, all together, you get a much more powerful understanding. And I think it, that also we talked about pre, uh, prototypes. Yeah, it, it's true that you can't replace prototypes, but in a way, you are able to do faster prototyping. So before you even kind of, um, I always like to think about it as, a, as an iterative process, you have this understanding, you, under, you have the phenomena, and you're reading it, and you're changing and modifying. So this is kind of a the prototyping mode of action that allows you to move kind of forward with some hypotheses and assumptions and validate them as you're um, getting more inputs into, into play. Well, speaking of action, I'm going to move to the final slide so that everyone on the, on the uh, webinar can get um, Tom and Kobe's contact information. And also, um, uh, there's some great calls to action here, which we'll make in a moment. But I want to answer a couple more questions. Um, Henry Greger asks, and I think this is a great fundamental question, what are the sources of data for the typical company? What are the sources? Well, you know, it's from patent databases about products um, and innovation, clinical trials, if you are in the industries of uh, pharmaceuticals or healthcare, even CPG and, and, uh, and food and beverage. Um, as I said, social listening from Facebooks, uh, Twitters, forums, blogs, uh, and then you have financial information that is basically available in different sources such as, you know, Connect uh, Capital IQ um, or, uh, you know, Bloomberg or financial reports by companies. Uh, I think it's, you know, there is a set, we, we hold today a set of around 150 different um, sources that um, are different by the way that they, um, you know, give you the inputs or the, the key intelligence perimeter that you can extract to analytics. So if I may, I'm going to throw out one more question here because I think this is a great one from, from Jim Forsyth. Do you have any suggest, suggestion on better empowering, how to better empower the product development owners to think about the data and what they would like it to solve before the product is sort of launched into production? So. What, em what can empower product managers and product developers, Tom? Well, you know, I don't, um, one would hope that in many cases they already have the power to say, you know, we don't think this product is going to be successful in the, in the marketplace, you know, to, to participate actively in the, in the decision process about whether to go ahead with it or not. I think one of the, one of the good things, although it can be a political process, about taking a decision orientation and specifying who's really making that decision, you know, if, if you're a new product developer and you don't have any say into whether the, the product goes ahead or not, one, you might want to look for a new job, and two, you might want to think, well, great, um, uh, tell me what decisions I can make so that I invest some time and energy on them. I don't want to waste a lot of of effort, you know, coming up with a decision that I'm not really empowered to make. So I think a strong decision orientation can kind of clear those things up a bit. Uh, yeah, Tom, I think, you know, and I think the environment is changing. Uh, if you think about it, um, I think that we, we today can see more and more new uh, types of um, leaders. Um, that have come over, I've seen it in the last seven years, um, that kind of the, the atmosphere changed. So people are much more kind of acknowledging the, that, you know, evidence and data driven and decision making is, is, is more powerful than not just the intuition or, 
for the knowledge. Um, so I'm hoping that you know over time we'll see more and more. Uh, but I think the other point is really using some sort of you know templatizing things and seeing the kind of how scenarios can roll out. I love visualization. I think it's a, you know it's great tools to to get engagement and kind of think about how you you know produce the new thing. Uh, so um, yeah, that's kind of more tactical on the, on the side of. It. Well, well, speaking of tactical, we'll, we'll make this the last question. And by the way, if we haven't answered your question, we're going to endeavor to on email. But this comes from Prakash, and it's back to Tom's example of P&G. <laughs> it's a great question, and, and all of us who are in the room have worked with P&G and have so much admiration for them. He asks, how widely is analytics embedded in the organization? Maybe it's only at the top echelons of management and not at the plant level, for example. Do they really stand out at the highest level of analytics maturity if we use Tom's Delta framework? Um, yes. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for that plug for my, my ideas, Prakash. Um, I think, uh, you know, as a company overall, they're pretty um, uh, pervasive in their use. Uh, they have, I think the last count I heard, 58,000 people pay for access to this decision cockpit information, so that tells you something. At the plant level, I think it's probably fair to say that they have not had a huge amount of information penetration compared to, you know, Cincinnati headquarters or whatever, but um, my guess is as companies go, they'll be among the first to, to get information out to everybody who could possibly benefit from it. Well, thank you for that. I, I've noticed in many of the uh, forums we've been in lately that a lot of the uh, innovators are talking about turning to their supply chain as sources for innovation. So my guess is uh, P&G is probably yeah. and, and, um, already working on that front too. We, we do some, some work on supply chain and I can tell you that a lot of the data that is out there in the open source, um, so speci specifically in, in the supply chain, must be connected to the internal data. I think that's a, or maybe we kind of leave you with that to think about, uh, maybe it's another webinar. Yeah, <laughs> so we definitely have time. We have a, we definitely have the need to do, I think, a few more bits really, on the shape uh, of this, maybe, the size of this. Tom, I think we both agree, how do we make the connection between the internal data and the external data? That's where I think even more powerful analytics uh, would come out. Yeah, well, the new frontier. Uh, 4.0. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're waiting for your book, Tom. Hey, hey we just got into 3.0. Give me a break. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank you, Tom. It's really been a pleasure to get to know you and get to work with you. And thank you, Kobe. And thank, most of all, thank all of you for joining us today and to just restate that you're going to be able to download the PowerPoint and view um, the webinar and continue the conversation. When you sign off, a quick survey is going to pop up from GoToWebinar. And by the way, thank you to Citrix and GoToWebinar. And Ryan, you've been you know, wonderful. Um, please take the survey and give us feedback. It's really important to us. We really strive to deliver value to our community. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, signing off here. Signing off in New York. Thank you. <laughs>